backstage noble wife, the story of America's favorite family of the footlights and their fight for security and happiness against the concrete heart of Broadway. It's shortly after yesterday's episode now as Harry, suffering from peanut fever, is being taken home by Dr. Stoll and Chandler. And since no gasoline is available for the ambulance, they've settled for a wheelbarrow. And as we join them in front of the peanut butter factory, we hear... Well, okay, boy, let's start shoving him home here. Yeah, are you comfortable there, Mr. Backstage? Oh, yes, yes, most comfortable in this condition. You're quite a weight, boy. Well, do it a little bit at a time, Chandler. Watch the curb there. Uh, they be careful. Oh, don't worry about the curb, boy. Oh, oh. I was going to tip over then. You're all right, boy. You know, it's almost four miles to our house in Skunk Haven. Well, yeah. I hope my arms can hold out, boy. Well, why don't you take one uh, arm of the wheel down and I take the other, Chandler? I wonder if you could uh, change the fulcrum a little, boy. Could you move back a little oh. towards the rear? Well, of course, being in this position, it's not, not too easy. Ch well, how's that, uh, Chandler? Just a little better, boy. Yeah. Listen to those birds. Yeah, spring's just around the corner, all right. I think they're back north a little too early, boy. We don't have an oil can with you, do you, Chandler? Yes, I do, boy. Uh, wheels are a little squeaky there. Maybe we'll put some oil in it when we get a little bit further along. Did you hear that klaxon horn, boy? I thought I heard something peculiar, yeah. One of those new cars. Must be one of those things you buy in an automobile store. Gag, boy. Why, hello, Akbar. Have you uh, met the Akbar Mai Tai, Chandler? Well, let me Dr. put you Stone? down for a minute. Yeah, yeah, let's take a little break here. Uh, how do you do, boy? How do you do, uh, Mr. Mai Tai? You know, there's a job at the peanut butter factory open for you if uh, you want to apply for it, Akbar, now that I'm ill with peanut fever. <laughs> oh, we're watching it, boy. We hear your horn. Yeah, show off, might boy. be a chance for you to have some work if you'd like to have it. Yeah, there's a job there, boy, because uh, what kind of a job did you have there? Well, I was known officially as a peanut engineer. Actually, I was cracking the peanuts as they came down the, the pipe. I well, think uh, you could do that, too, Akbar. If I were you, boy, I'd hot-foot it right over to the peanut butter factory and apply for the job, boy. Yeah, that sounds like a good opening for you. Yeah, why don't you go, Akbar? Go ahead. It'd be a good job for you. All right, I will. Well, let's start right. wheeling. Start up again, boy. Backstage. Uh, do we take a right or a left up here at the corner? It's a uh, right. Take a right there at the corner. Huh? Uh, too bad they didn't have a wooden wheelbarrow. I usually prefer to ride in a wooden one rather than a metal oh, one. They haven't made those in years, boy. Oh, no. The metal oh, ones. metal. Much stronger. Sure. Mary's certainly going to be surprised when we come wheeling up the front walk. She doesn't even know I've got peanut fever. Did you, uh, did you feel a few raindrops, boy? Oh, I, no, I don't believe I did. We have almost four miles to go. We don't have any roof on this contraption. It's just you, me, and backstage sitting there or standing there in the wheelbarrow. Well, I'm standing, but I look like I'm sitting down. That's no, the nature of the disease you have there, too. We must make some picture for these people going by in the cars, boy. I imagine this is the first manual ambulance that's uh, been used lately, anyway. Yes, it's certainly a novel way to be taken home. Oh, I do feel rain now, yes. Yeah. Oh, here's a big curb, boy. I don't know. It's... Oh, I can right. help you there, China. All right, now you just sit as you are backstage. All don't right. move a muscle. I won't. Is it? Rolled right out of it. Are you all right, Mr. Backstage? Mr. Backstage, boy. Boy. So, as the storm begins, Chandler and Dr. Stoll seem to have overturned the wheelbarrow and Harry in it. Be sure and join us tomorrow when we'll hear Chandler say, We can't get him up, boy. That's tomorrow in the next exciting episode of Mary Backstage, Noble Wife, Word Car Speaking. We have a gentleman with us today 
his name has become virtually a, well, household byword, to use a trite phrase. Throughout America, I'd like for you to meet him now, Mr. Theodore Evans Pomfort. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Pomfort, we certainly want to thank you for taking time out from your busy schedule to come up and visit with our show today. Well, I like to keep in direct contact with the public whenever my itinerary permits it. It just happens that on this occasion, I was able to squeeze you in between some other stuff. That's certainly a break for us. I imagine you're generally on the go day and night, huh? Yes, it seems to just aren't enough hours in the day for everything. I suppose not. You still uh, operating out of the same place? Yes, yes. I've been there now for almost, oh, what, 28 years. And uh, for the good of the nation, you can bet your boots I'm not going to retire until they carry me out. Well, I'm sure that comes as good news to our listeners because things certainly wouldn't be the same without you. Well, sometimes I feel that I've let myself become involved in more endeavors than I really should have, but I just can't seem to betray a public trust once I've assumed it. Of course, it's that devotion to duty which has gained you so much respect. Yes, I guess there isn't a schoolboy in the land who doesn't know how I feel about all that kind of stuff. No, I'm sure there isn't. Not that I blow my own horn. The accolades just uh, roll in. A lot of mail and all that, huh? Very, very heavy mail. Mm -hmm. Telegrams, too. You'd be appalled. I bet I would. Some stuff from crackpots, of course, but mostly heartfelt letters of thanks and devotion. Well, that's only natural. You know, I could could chat like this for hours, but my schedule just doesn't permit it. So if uh, you'll excuse me. Certainly, sure. And we're just honored that uh, you could make it up here at all. eh? Goodbye. Goodbye. Say goodbye. Hmm? What? Uh, who, who was that guy? I don't know. I was going to ask you the same thing. After all, you, you invited him. I huh? didn't invite him. I thought you invited him. No, I never heard of him before. Well, then uh, why'd you give him that big, fancy introduction? Well, he wrote it out, and I just read it. What was his name again? I forget. But whoever he was, you folks at home, remember that you heard him first here on the Bob and Ray Show. <laughs> Next, Mary Backstage, Noble Wife, the story of America's favorite family of the footlights and of their fight for security and happiness against the concrete heart of Broadway. It's some time after our last episode now as Dr. Stoll and Chandler, his associate, continue to push the wheelbarrow containing Harry, suffering from peanut fever, toward the backstage summer home in Skunk Haven. And as we join them, we hear Chandler say, Well, it's really coming down now, boy. Yes, I'm soaking wet. I guess you two are too, aren't you? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a wet, rainy day, all right. The Which one? Stage, how much yes. further is it where you live now, boy? Let's see if I can... That's the third house there on the right, Chandler. That crazy bird out in all this bad weather, boy. Yes, you'd think he'd take cover, but I guess he's an individualist. All right, come on, Chandler. One more push here, and we'll have him up on the front. How do you feel, Mr. Backstage? Oh, I'm feeling uh, pretty well, Doctor. Thank you. It'd be good to get in the warm house, though. Yeah, it'll be that. Maybe we better knock on the door, boy. All right. Is your wife expecting you now? Well, no. She, of course, doesn't know that I contracted peanut fever. Oh, she's home. Well, she couldn't go anywhere. We don't have any gas for the car. Oh, hello, Mary. Oh, oh. What's, what's wrong, Harry? Uh, we'll let them wheel me in, and I'll, I'll tell you when well, we get uh, inside. Wait a minute, Mrs. Backstage, boy. Your husband here has peanut fever. That's right, Mary. <coughs> peanut fever? What in the world is that? Well, Mrs. Backstage, it's a strange malady that comes from uh, working there at the peanut butter factory, the way your husband was. He has it bad, boy. Oh, hello, Calvin. Hello. What? Hey. What's the matter, It's Harry? peanut fever. Well, look, you you stand, walk around like you're sitting down. Yeah, well, that's what it does to you. He's in no particular pain, of course, but uh, he will take a few days to get over it after Why, we get uh, the serum. You're only two or three feet tall now, Harry, walking around like that. Yes, uh, well, let me walk over to that easy chair. Ah. <laughs> you look kind of funny. Well, I suppose it does look rather funny for me to be walking I don't mean way. to laugh at your misfortune. Is it, <laughs> is it serious, uh, Dr. No, Stoll? it's not too serious. Once we get the serum, and uh, that ought to clear everything up in three or four days. Where do you get the serum? Well, I have to call. I'll have to look up the number in my little book in my in my doctor's bag here. Hey, you know what you need? What's that, uh, Calvin? How about a 
little taste, you know? Oh, a little a, warming ingredient there? A blast. Sure, oh, sure thing. Okay, let me pour let me one for you. Well, let me go through the through the book here. Simmons. Um, de -de -de -do. Serum, serum, serum. De -de -de -do. De -de -do. Hey, wait a minute. That's enough there, boy. Oh, yes. No more than that, Mr. Backstage. All right. Uh, there you are. Thank you, uh, There Calvin. you are, Harry. That ought to straighten you up. <sighs> oh, well, that certainly, certainly does warm things up. I'll say that. I'll say that for it. Oh, uh, not one. No, no, not yet, uh, Calvin. I found the address of the serum place. It's in Parsippany. Parsippany, the... New Jersey? Yeah, that's right. May I use your phone, Mrs. Backstage? Why, of course. All right. <clears throat> Where is it, please? There, right over there. Oh, I see. Uh, Harry, go ahead, finish it. Well, all right. Take another one. Say so. Well, uh, why don't you make one of those for me, boy? All right, uh, I'll do that. Yes, maybe Dr. Stoll would like one, too. Yeah, I would. It's ringing now. Dana Fever, Serum Company. Uh, this is Dr. Stoll in uh, Skunk Haven. Yeah? We've got a new case of peanut fever out here, and uh, we'll need some serum right away. Well, uh, how can That's we enough, get That's enough, Calvin. You? Calvin. Yes. Hold on, hold on. That's enough. Oh, all right. Hello? Hello? Yes, uh, when could we get some uh, peanut fever serum? Well, we've uh, stopped making deliveries because we don't have any gas out here. If you could send somebody here to Parsippany, you could have all the peanut fever serum you want. Well, that's funny. The backstages don't have any gasoline either, I understand. Well, we have that one, boy. Isn't that right, the Mrs. Backstage? I'm sorry. What you have you... no gasoline for your car. No, we don't have any gasoline, and you have to be half full. <laughs> I guess we all are out to get some gas. I'm half gassed right now. <laughs> yeah. Now, let me have another one of those, uh, Calvin. Well, I'll have another one of those too, boy. How do you suggest we get hold of that serum, then? Uh... Send somebody out here. Dean of Beaver Avenue, Persephone, New Jersey. We don't have a zip code. All right, thank you. We'll see if we can do something about it. Anybody here got an automobile to go to Parsippany? No, the only way we can get out there is for me to get out my horse. And so, with a lack of gasoline and no vehicle available, Calvin suggests he head for Parsippany by horse. And you want to join us tomorrow when we'll hear Calvin say... I'd better put blinders on him. That's tomorrow in the next exciting episode of Mary Backstage, Noble Wife. Word Car Speaking. Boy, right, Webb, well, you used to have a theme, I just happened to say. Yeah, right. It was kind of a hokey theme, like... meaning here comes the idiot type of dum dee dum dee doodle dee Like they used to run on for Mortimer Snurd or something. <laughs> That's what it was, I think. Well, I was... The mother of me doesn't like when you kid me that way. Well, it's all in good fun. You know I that. I have a very high IQ, I'll have you know. All right. 200. Well, that is high. Puts me ahead of Einstein. Sure does. And a few other people. Are you putting it to good use? Not too well. I can't get my checkbook to balance. Uh, but I guess that's one, a common uh, failure with one geniuses. One whether Einstein could have. Just I don't know. You know, with, uh, with geniuses such... Well, I don't want to say I'm a genius, but with people uh, like Einstein and myself, uh, you know, we see the big picture. We right. don't see the little stuff. Can't be uh, bothered with details. Right, making checkbooks, balance. We know that if it gets out of hand, you'll hear from somebody, usually the bank. Right. Sure. And the next day. Immediately. It used to go three or four days. Now it's a matter of minutes. But why is it the checks you write always uh, don't clear uh, quicker than uh, the ones that uh, the bank gives you? You know what I mean? No, I, I wish that. you'd run that by me again, Uncle Bob. I'll have to think what I meant. I, I thought of this last night, but I was half asleep. Oh. You look so. kind of sleepy right now, as a matter of fact. No, I'm wide awake, as a matter of fact. Oh, this is right. how I look when I'm wide awake. <laughs> really? We have uh, some items. Ray, he's in trouble. Uh, yeah, Ray's asleep. Yeah, right. Oh, the, I'm not. No, uh, I'm oh, I thought right you were. a button over here. Just is... waiting to be called upon. Hello, and welcome to The Secret Heart of Sable, a story of today and days to come. Now to bring you up to date, when Milford Sanchez visited the office of attorney Marcel Menifee, she was dismayed to find that he would not defend her. And when attorney Marcel Menifee suggested to Mildred Sanchez that she see Bernard Bennett, 
She flew into a rage and called Alma Everest, her best friend and county recorder. Together, they went to see Clifton Lindbergh and Erwin Kemp. And as you recall, a meeting took place at Cliff House, the fashionable restaurant owned by Carl Ritter, Jesse Lee Paul, and Herbert Lindquist. It was at that time that noted Sanchez and her best friend, county recorder Alma Everest, Explain the situation to the owners of Cliff House. And Clifton Lindbergh and Erwin Kemp, who had already heard Mildred Sanchez's story, talked to Lou Kelso at another table. And when George Adnar, a waiter at Cliff House, overheard the conversation, he called Nat Dempsey, an underworld figure and part owner of Tom Roxy, light heavyweight champ of Sable. Meanwhile, Diane Ickes was raised with Mildred Sanchez, but was not on speaking terms with her because of a fight over Ralph Sable happened to be in the popular Cliff House restaurant and overheard George Adnar's call to Nat Dempsey. She waited till George Adnar got out of the phone booth and then placed a mysterious call to Ned Gelding in Orchard Beach, Arizona. Then, as you all remember, Clifton Lindbergh and Owen Kemp decided that the dark mystery of Cliff House might be solved by looking at the guest book. And bribing Rosetta Morph for the privilege of glancing through the guest book was easy. And the guest book of popular Cliff House contained the following names. Larry Hogel, Nadine Lynch, Arthur Stapleton, Clyde Decker, Lester Leonard, Patricia Cantwell, Jim Hartz, Lyman Lloyd, Mark Dodge, Stuart Klein, Gerald DeBono, Rosalie Curl, Bruce Helfand, and John Grafferty. Somewhere in that list was the solution to the mystery of popular Cliff House and to Mildred Sanchez's troubles, and Erwin Kemp and Clifton Lindbergh knew it. So they decided to visit the guests who had signed the Cliff House guest book. And as you may recall, Nadine Lynch and Lester Leonard were the first ones Clifton Lindbergh and Erwin Kemp visited. And the difficulties they had are familiar to all of us because Nadine Lynch and Lester Leonard had moved and the new tenants, Olga Blanchard and Otto Cannon, didn't know where they'd moved to. But the visit to Gerald de Bono paid off handsomely when Clifton Lindbergh and Erwin Kemp found a Cliff House menu in his room. Which seemed to tie him in with the owners of Cliff House, Carl Ritter, Jesse Lee Poe, and Herbert Lindquist. And when Gerald Bono lifted the phone and called his attorney, Marcel Menefee, who, of course, was the lawyer who had refused to defend Mildred Sanchez, Clifton Lindbergh and Erwin Kemp became suspicious. And went back to Cliff House to tell Mildred Sanchez of their discovery. But when they got there, they found that Cliff House had been shuttered because of an obscure zoning law. And as they prepared to leave the shuttered Cliff House, they were approached by a mysterious stranger who identified himself only as Mr. L. And only after being severely coaxed by Clifton Lindbergh and Erwin Kemp did the mysterious stranger relent and give his real name, Lyman Lloyd. And that's where the story would have picked up today as Clifton Lindbergh and Erwin Kemp continue questioning Lyman Lloyd in the 764th installment of The Secret Heart of Sable. Mr. Baitai. Yes, I was a little bit late getting here. There's more traffic than I I'd planned to run into. You going to be on the backstages today? I don't know yet. I haven't been over to the other studio. I think I am. Wow, uh, you weren't here for the run-through? No, not yet. Well, I don't know as you will be on. Uh, usually, uh, Mr., uh, what's his name who writes that show? Frisbee. Chester Mr. has but Frisbee. Mr. Frisbee insists that people be here at 11 o'clock for the first run-through. You could be in deep trouble, Akbar. Yeah, right. Well, I didn't think uh, it was that important. Just a quick run-through. Hi, Akbar. Oh, hello, Mr. Frisbee. I had you written in today. Well, I've just uh, arrived. I was a little bit late in getting here, but I got you right over... You know that we have a run-through at 11 o'clock. Yes, I know. There's no that... excuse for you not being here. Well, there is an excuse. I got tied up and couldn't make it quite so... Oh, it's almost 4 o'clock. Well, I know it's it is. five hours late. But there's 15 minutes to go over my part. How many lines would I have? Three. Well, three lines won't take me two seconds to... Well, if you can turn your back on 75 cents like that, then uh, maybe you don't need to work here at all. Oh, no, I do need to work. I need to work, Mr. Frisbee. Well, why don't you get in here on time? Well, I'll try to be more timely in a day's to come. Oh, you Oh, come on, I can't understand either of you guys. <laughs> Next, Mary 
backstage noble wife, the story of America's favorite family of the footlights and of their fight for security and happiness against the concrete heart of Broadway. With Harry suffering from peanut fever, Dr. Stoll and Chandler decided that the only thing to do was to go for peanut fever serum, manufactured in Parsippany, New Jersey. But upon calling the Parsippany Peanut Fever Serum Company, they learned that they had no gasoline to have it delivered. Now, it's a few moments later as they all discuss the situation. And try to well, I don't know what. We have to get that serum. We have no gasoline. I don't know what we're going to do. Well, we don't have any gasoline here, and they don't have any there. That's the problem. They've got the serum, though, and That's we right, need it. right, boy. Yes, of course, we need it. I... I'd like to get over this case of peanut fever just as soon as I can and get back to work. Hey, wait a minute. The thought just has occurred to me. What's that, Calvin? I uh, have a horse. I don't know if you realize that. A horse? Yeah, 16 hands high. A horse? A horse? A horse? A horse, boy. Ach, so, a horse. Yes, and uh, we've had him uh, oh, about 15 years now. Oh, Calvin, you never mentioned your horse before. Who takes care of it? Wait a minute, it's not him, it's uh, her. Oh. It's called Lady. Lady? Yeah. Lady. Lady? Lady. Lady boy. Ach, so, Lady. Yeah, Lady. And uh, the mother of me takes good care of her. Oh. She's in that uh, little barn we have out in back there, you uh -huh. know, out uh -huh. beyond the gazebo. Yes. Well, do you think that uh, the horse could stand the trip all the way to Parsippany? I don't know. I've never ridden the horse much further than, like, around the house two or three times and then uh, back to the stall. You're not an established horseman, then. Oh, I know how to ride a horse, and I have the jodfers and the, the riding boots, and I have the hat and all that paraphernalia. Well, it looks like it's the only thing we can do, uh, Harry and Mrs. Backstage, is to let Calvin go for the serum. Uh-huh. You know, uh, I'm trying to think now... I probably uh, should go over the upper level of the 59th Street Bridge because that's what Mr. Mead always recommends on the radio. Yes, that's usually the uh, least uh, traveled route at this uh -huh. time of day. I, and then, I, of course, I'd save the, uh, the uh, toll. I wonder what the toll is in the Queen's Midtown for a horse. I don't know whether they even have a, an established toll, but you'll you bet, find out. You bet they do. I imagine they do. Nobody goes through those tunnels for nothing. No way, no however. What did you say, Akbar? I said my third line. I can't see anyone. Oh. Well, why don't you go next door and get the horse, uh, Calvin, and... Speak up if you want, Akbar. Say whatever you want. I can't see it. Go ahead. Make a little money. He's only written three lines. I don't care. Once you're on the air, you're on your own. He can't... He can't stop you. We're Cal on the air now. All right, Calvin, I'll go with you to your house and help you bring Lady back over here. All right, that's a very good idea. And then I can get all set to go. Meantime, I'll get out a road map for Calvin so you'll be able to find your way over there. Well, I think I'll go right out the expressway all the way in and then uh, uh, get off there at uh, Van Damme Street and then uh, cut up over the 59th Street Bridge off a level with my horse, Lady. Yeah, that sounds like a good way to go. I as I will. Well, come on, let's get the horse, Calvin. How many lines have you set? Oh, it must be eight or nine. Oh, oh that's terrific. And so Calvin starts to set out for Parsippany for the peanut fever serum. You want to join us tomorrow when we'll hear the man at the serum company say, There you are. Just sign here, please. That's tomorrow in the next exciting episode of Mary Backstage, Noble Wife. Word Carr speaking. Did you notice that that car kind of went over the bounds there, over the limit, didn't oh, he? I've never... That was the most unprofessional thing I've ever heard, to even <laughs> talk on the air <laughs> about uh, how they were earning a little extra money. Well, he... He earned the, the maximum 250 today by inserting those other sentences. But I don't think it helped the story. It made me look foolish on the air. And it didn't help his image either. Well, I didn't mean to do anything wrong, uh, Mr. Frisbee. It was just I was going to stop after the third line. But I... Mrs. Backstage said, go ahead, say some more. If I didn't have complete control of my emotions, I'd punch you, Akbar, right in the nose. Oh, now, come on. We don't need to... <clears throat> 
resort to fisticuffs here, Chet. Oh, no, 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 we don't want to do that. No, it's not that. I said I wouldn't do it. I have complete control of my emotions. Yes, but you look angry. You're all clouding up like you're going to lose control. I would say this, that if anybody went in back of you and bent down, I might be inclined to give you a push. Well, I certainly, for one, am not going to do that. Uh, Akbar is a good friend of mine. No, I won't do it either. Good friend he of only made two fifty, and he really needed the money. You know that, Mr. Fordbill. Why don't you just shake hands and make up, and uh, tomorrow's another day and all that kind of thing, huh? It's all right with me, well, sure. Well, it's okay with me, sure. All right, let's shake. Yes. <laughs> Ow! Oh, that's a strong grip you've got there, Mr. Frisby. Must be from years of typewriting, hmm? Well, it could be. <clears throat> Here once again to help our listeners with their mental and emotional problems is the eminent New York psychiatrist, Dr. Rupert Llewellyn Hume. Uh, what's that thing you have strapped on your back there, Doctor? It looks like a parachute. Yes, it is a parachute. I feel a lot more comfortable wearing one when I'm in one of these big office buildings. If the thing should suddenly collapse, I figure I could just bail out. Well, I don't think a big modern building like this has ever collapsed, has it? I don't have the statistics, Mr. Goulding. I just have the phobia. I see. Well, all right. Suppose we move right along mm -mm. to uh, this week's mail. Our first letter comes from a man in Fredonia, New York. He writes, I am sure that my dog, Frederick, can understand everything I say. As a result, I'm hesitant to discuss any personal affairs at home with my wife because I'm afraid that Frederick will blab them all over town. Now, how can I overcome this fear? Well, the easiest solution would be to... Hold off any personal discussions till after the dog has gone to bed. Mm -hmm. This isn't possible. I suggest that the man and his wife learn to converse in some foreign language that the dog doesn't understand. Very well. Yes. Here's one from a lady in uh, Waco, Texas. Yes. You hear uh, the sound of ice cubes clinking in glasses? No, I don't. If you're having a New Year's party around here someplace and don't want to invite me, you can just say so. We're not having any party, Doctor. Now, this lady in Texas, she writes, The main highway leading west out of Waco has been closed for repair work. Yes. I keep fearing that they'll close it on the other side of town, too, and that we'll all be trapped there. My husband says that I'm nutty as a fruitcake, but I know this is a real danger. What should I do? Doctor? It's awfully hard for me to concentrate with those people laughing and whooping it up at the party that way. Can't you get them to hold it down a little? But, Doctor, there's no party going on here. Now, uh, what advice would you have for this woman? Get out of town while the road's still open. You've been listening to the public service program, Speak Your Mind. Our guest speaker was the eminent New York psychiatrist, Dr. Rupert Llewellyn Hume. Be sure to be with us next time when Dr. Hume solves more of the mental and emotional problems confronting our listeners. Next, Mary Backstage, Noble Wife, the story of America's favorite family of the footlights and of their fight for security and happiness against the concrete heart of Broadway. On Friday, Calvin L. Hoogevin set out on horseback for Parsippany, New Jersey, hoping to secure some much-needed peanut fever serum for Harry. Now, as he approaches the Queen's Midtown Tunnel, we hear... Yeah. Oh. Oh. That 59th Street Bridge was too busy. I had to come through the tunnel here. Hey, where do you think you're going with that horse? I'm going to Parsippany, New Jersey, and I have to go through the tunnel here, sir. Parsippany, New Jersey? Yes. On horseback? Are you crazy or something? No, I'm not crazy. I'm uh, on my way to get the uh, penis fever serum. You see, Harry Baxter... Oh, be quiet. Oh, everybody's so impatient. Uh, be quiet back there. Uh, a friend of mine, Harry Baxter. Oh, the famous uh, Broadway star. Yeah, he come down with penis fever. And uh, the only place you can get serum is over in Parsippany, New Jersey. Well, that's Don't... something I never knew about. Oh, be quiet back there. Oh, no. Be quiet. Get that horse out of there. And you say you want to go through the tunnel to reach Parsippany. Well, I've got to go. That's a good one, ain't it, Charlie? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's so funny? Well, it's just that we have never had a horse go through here before, much less a, a horseback rider. What do I owe you? Well, I don't know. What do you think, Charlie? We should charge him. Well, I don't know. Uh, what's to say in the park? Let me look. Hey, will you get that horse out of there? Hey, uh, come on! I didn't hear about horses at all. What's your name, young man? Uh, my 
I am is Calvin, C A L V I N, Hooverman. H O O E V I N. All right, I'll take your name and your address. Where are you from? I'm from Skunk Haven. I live with the mother of me, Skunk Haven, oh, Long River. Right, all right. Well, give me 50 cents. And if it's any more than that, we'll have to send you a letter. All right, there you are, sir. Driver's seat. Oh, let me write it out. Right down right there. Come on, get there. Horse out of there. Okay, there's your receipt. Don't go on into the tunnel. All right, come on, lady. Come on, lady. Come on. Come on, lady. Come on. Come on. Lady. Come on. 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 Come And a few hours later, Calvin arrives at the center of Parsippany, New Jersey. And we hear... <laughs> oh, be quiet! I've never I've seen so many impatient people. Everywhere I go, cars in the back of me, people yelling, getting all red in the face, tooting their horn. What's the matter with people, anyway? Say, do you know where the, the peanut uh, serum factory is? You mean the old peanut serum factory, don't you? Well, I don't know how old it is, but uh, I've come here to get the... The syrup, or the oh. syrup. Well, Parsephone used to be famous for the peanut fever serum, but they don't make it anymore. You mean the... Uh, Company's gone out of business. It used to be right over there where that foundation is, those bricks and stones. There is no peanut fever serum factory anymore? There's no peanut fever serum factory in Parsephone anymore. Well, do you know where there is a peanut serum factory? I think the nearest one would be in Philadelphia. Philadelphia? Philadelphia. Philadelphia? Philadelphia. Who are those guys? I don't know, but that's what I would suggest, that you ride right along and get to Philadelphia. Well, I can't. Lady here is tired. We'll have to, uh... We'll have to go... Is there a hotel here in Parsippany? No, I'm afraid not. Just these few houses. This main street. Well... I have a shelter half here under my saddle. I suppose I could put that up here in the, you know, where the factory used to be and spend the night. And take off to Philadelphia in the morning. It's all right with me. Is there any grain and feed place around here where I could get something for the horse? It's down at the end of Main Street. You'll see a grain and feed store. Okay. And do they have a curry a comb down there? Do they have what? A curry comb. I want to comb the horse, lady here. Oh, you'll have to ask him. I don't know. But there's a hardware store, they might have one. Okay. Oh, come on, Calvin. And so, Calvin, here's the disturbing news that there is no peanut fever serum in Parsippany. Will he head on to Philadelphia? Be sure and join us tomorrow when we'll hear Mary say, I wonder where Calvin is. That's tomorrow in the next exciting episode of Mary Backstage, Noble Wife. Word Carr speaking. Wally Ballou is all set at Albany, Oregon, for a broadcast from the log rolling contest out there. So come in, please, Wally Ballou. Well, what did that signal yeah. mean, then? Does, is it time for Wally Ballou? All right. Now to... Hello. Now, why does this happen always to us when uh, all these other people can... I don't know. They can go on remotes. Hold it, Bob. Yeah. Just to go ahead. We take you now to Albany, Oregon, where Wally... Wally Ballou here at Albany, Oregon, where the great national log rolling contest is under full swing. I think... The, oh, there goes one now. We haven't as yet had an interview with a gentleman whose chances seem to be very good. Your name is Pierre, is that right? That's right, there, Pierre, the half-breed. And, uh, Pierre, I understand that uh, you hold some sort of a championship. Uh, I would stay on top of the log there the longest. How long was that? Well, I was about, uh, oh, I don't know that. I was about, uh, I would stay on there about a day there one. Well, what happens now to find a winner? These fellows just keep rolling logs all day until they all fall off but one? What time? Let me put it a little more plainly, uh, Pierre. 
You stay on the log until you fall off, right? You stay on the log there until you go by the finish line on it there. You was trying to move your log. Oh, I see. Stay on top and not go in the water. I if see. If you was get your feet wet, that's okay, though. But you get your shoulder wet, that means you fall down on it. You can get out, your then. feet wet, ladies and gentlemen. It is one of the rules. Your feet can't be wet, but your shoulder can't. Well, if your shoulder gets wet on it, there... Then you're already in. That would be that you've fallen over. What do you do for trailing for this kind of work, Pierre? Uh, you train on top logs, there. What well, else you think? I mean, how else anything? can you train there? You've got to practice on top of the log, and... With okay, the water, well, the cascades was run by there. Now you're going to put your log in the water and start out, is that right? And they'll time you from the time you start. That's right there. They put the log on top of the water, and then I will step on it and keep it spinning. Oh, so Pierre has put the log into the water here at the side of the river. Uh, how deep is the water there, Pierre? The water here is so deep there, it's about two feet on it. Two it feet. It was go out and come very deep, though. You go way out there. It was on top of the head. I understand, Pierre. Now, how do you go about getting out of the log? By you that step I mean, on there, how was, do you depart? I was using these hobnail boots there. It was gripped the bark on it. All right, now you're going to get on it, right? I'm on it now. Oh, he's standing on it now. Now I'm spinning. Now the log starts Good luck to on spin. Top of me, and there he goes down the river. How is this qualified there? He's disqualified. The champion is disqualified. And now this is Wally Ballou returning you to... Next, Mary Backstage, Noble Wife. The story of America's favorite family of the footlights and of their fight for security and happiness against the concrete heart of Broadway. Yesterday, Calvin discovered that the closest place to get the serum to cure Harry's case of peanut fever is Philadelphia, not Parsippany, New Jersey. Meanwhile, at the backstage summer home in Skunk Haven, Long Island, we see Mary, Harry, Greg Marlowe, and Pop Beloved as they discuss the situation. Well, I just hope he arrives. I keep looking out the curtains, hoping he'll be coming up on horseback any moment with the needed serum. Well, he's only been gone about three hours, Mary. I don't think we could expect him back here this soon, really. Well, I'm one of those optimists, you know. I keep expecting the best to happen all the time. Well, I know if it can be done, Calvin L. Hoogavid will see that the serum is delivered and on time. I've uh, I've never heard of this uh, peanut fever, Harry. Do you have any pain, or is it... Uh... No. No, none at all, Greg. That's the strange part of it. You it's... just walk around like you're sitting down. Yes, apparently that's it. Do you get any cramp feeling, or...? No, I haven't as yet. And do you sleep in the same way? I guess you do, eh? Yes, uh-huh. Uh, you could sleep in a chair, I suppose. Or... Well, I could. I sleep on my back normally, though. Oh, I see. And then you... Looks like an inverted Z. Yeah, something like that. Oh, there's the telephone, Mary. I'll get it. <clears throat> yeah, I'm nearer. Let me uh, pick it up here. Right. Hello? Hello? Who is this, please? This is uh, Calvin Hoogevin. Oh, oh, it's Calvin Hoogevin, Mary. Great Who? pop. Yeah. Who? Where is he? Calvin. Where are you, Calvin? I'm in Parsippany, New Jersey. Oh, you got there, then. Hey, look, are you sitting down? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Harry. Uh, I didn't mean that, but I have some disturbing news. I meant to uh, reassure you before I gave it to you. Oh, what's that, Calvin? Did well, you get the serum? No, that's part of the bad news. He didn't get the serum, Mary. He what? He didn't get the serum. Well, why on serum? earth didn't he get the serum? Why on earth didn't you get the, the serum, Calvin? Well, let me explain. I got here to the uh, serum factory here in Parsippany, and uh, people told me that it was torn down. They left town weeks ago. And he got to Pacifany and found that the serum factory was torn down weeks or months ago. That's right. And I inquired around town as to uh, where they had gone to, and I was informed that the nearest uh, peanut butter seal serum factory is located down in Philadelphia, which is in Pennsylvania, as you know. He's discovered that the only place he can get the peanut fever serum yeah. is in Philadelphia oh. now. Oh, Philadelphia. Well... And, uh... Mary, could we have some more cocoa while you're not doing anything? All right, excuse me. Uh, Hello? Yes, yes Calvin? Now we're cut off. Oh. Look, uh, here's the thing. My horse lady is very tired. I don't think she can make Philadelphia and back. I don't mm. think she could make it one way. That would be quite a distance. So certainly. I'm, uh, I'm wondering, is there any way to get to Philadelphia from Parsippany, New Jersey, or is it impossible? I tell you, <clears throat> Calvin, if you got a phone number there, we can call you back. Well, we're looking at the thing. 
Yeah, there's a phone number here. Okay, can you give it to me and I'll call you right back. Maybe we'll have an idea about something. Yeah, I can't wait a minute. Hold on. It's CD50354. Okay. Hang up and I will talk this over and I'll get right back to you. Okay, I'll be right here. Right. Well, he is in, in trouble, Mary, and I guess I am too. Seems that he's got to get to Philadelphia <laughs> to uh, get the serum. And the lady, his horse is too tired. Too tired, huh? Yep. Says he doesn't think she'd make it even one way. Well, there is a bus, you know, Harry. Ah, here's a bus. Oh, thank you, Harry. <laughs> What's that about a bus, Pop? Yes, there's a bus that goes uh, directly from Parsippany to downtown Philadelphia. Well, why don't you tell that to uh, Calvin? Yeah, that's the answer if he can get the horse taken care of. D five oh, oh great. three five. Oh. Hey, Harry. Four. Oh. Yes. Well, why don't you uh, go out in the kitchen with Barry? Well, I'm on the phone here, Pop, right now. I hope Calvin's still wherever he phoned from. Sounded like he was in a phone booth, I guess. No. Should have stayed near it. Oh, there it is. Hello. Oh, it's a telephone boat in Stephanie, New Jersey. Yeah, it's uh, Harry, Calvin. Oh, yeah. Say, Pop just came up with an interesting bit of information. He says there's a direct bus from Parsippany to Philadelphia. Does it go right by here? Yes. Oh, now, good. What can you do with the horse? I'll leave the horse at the feed and grain station where I fed him. And then I can pick him up uh, when I come back or next week sometime. Oh, uh, well, you'd better make it before that if you can, young man. Well, the gas line's not so long now. Maybe we can get gas and I can get a horse van, you That's know? That's right. When does the bus go, Pop, you know? About the 5.15, I think. When does the uh, bus go, you know? 5.15, 515? Right. Oh, swell. Goes right from Main Street there. Okay, thank you very much. I'll do the best I can. Now, uh, you know, I don't have any money, Harry. Will they accept a credit card down there at the Turin factory? Oh, I think probably, sure. Try them anyway. And so Calvin will leave his horse lady in Parsippany and try to take the bus to Philadelphia for the serum. You ought to join us tomorrow when we'll hear... off the bus so we get this thing straight. Huh? That's tomorrow in the next exciting episode of Mary Backstage Noble Wife. Word Car speaking. And now, the makers of Grime, the magic shortening that spreads like lard, invite you to join us for another episode of The Gathering Dusk. As we look in on the Bessinger household today, Edna is still bedridden. It's late afternoon, and Mr. Clevenger, the owner of the Village Chimney Cleaning Service, is just entering the room. Oh, Village Chimney Sweep Clevenger. I was hoping you'd get here before dark, but I was afraid this might be your busy season. Uh, well, no, ma'am. Our busy season comes along in August and September, before people start building fires in their furnaces. I hadn't realized that at all. Yes, and once you get the furnace fires going, you have what we in the trade call a hot chimney. Mm. That's why I wore my asbestos uniform over here today. Well, when Daddy was living, he always had the chimney swept out in the middle of the winter. Well, your father was a little soft, Miss Edna. Everybody in town knew that. If you remember, he also used to have the lawn mowed all year round. He'd call in somebody in May or June to rake the leaves. Well, I think Daddy just figured that he could get a lower price if he had those things done during the off-season. Well, I know I had to work in a hot chimney every time I'd come over here. I used to soak him plenty for it, too. Mm. The boy who mowed the lawn used to charge more in January and February, too. He usually had to clear away the snow to get down to the grass. Yes, well, Miss Edna, I, I'm sure you didn't call me all the way over here just to reminisce about your father. Is there anything I can do for you? Well, yes, there is, Village Chimney Sweep Clevenger. It's that fireplace there in the corner. Santa Claus is coming soon, you know, and I want the chimney to be spick and span when he comes down. Well, I'm afraid I can't do a thing for you, Miss Edna. 
But if Sandy gets his red coat all covered with soot coming down, I, I know he'll just leave coal in my stocking. Yes, but uh, that's just a phony fireplace, Miss Edna. There's no chimney going up from it at all. It's just a decoration. That's what it is. Why, that's terrible. He'll never get in at all, then. And I wanted one of those little electric stoves that really cooks, and some roller skates, and a baby doll that says Mama. Well, I wouldn't worry, Miss Edna. I'm sure if Santa Claus finds you don't have a chimney, he'll come in through the window. Well, somebody's going to have to tip him off about this. I think if you wrote him a letter over your signature on your office stationery, it might help. I wonder if you'd be kind enough to do that. I'll see that it goes out in the evening mail, Miss Edna. Well, that would certainly be wonderful, Chimney Sweep Clevenger. You don't know what a load this takes off my mind. I almost feel as if I'm no longer standing in the gathering dusk. Ladies, why not make a New Year's resolution right now to spend less time in your kitchen picking little pieces of concrete and plaster out of your shortening? It's possible when you use grime, the magic shortening that spreads like lard. Try some today and be sure to be with us next time when Edna goes to the village in The Gathering Dusk. Today, our correspondent in Las Vegas, John Ralph Phipps, is standing by now with another of his famous celebrity interviews. So it's out to Las Vegas and John Ralph Phipps. This is John Ralph Phipps speaking from the lobby of the famous El Grotto Hotel here in Las Vegas. And here beside me is one of my favorite motion picture stars, and I'm sure he's one of your favorites too, Melvin Swarmcycle. Mel, it's uh, wonderful seeing you again, and I'm just trying to remember when we got together last for a chat like this. Well, uh, I don't think we've ever met before. Oh, I'm sure we have. Must have been when you were playing over at the Thunderhead two or three seasons ago. No, I've never played there. Well... It's not too important anyway, Mel. I'm sure our listeners uh, would be much more interested in hearing about your latest movie. You co-starred with Gwendolyn Flann, I think, aren't you? That's right. And, of course, the picture's an adaptation of Frank Emerson Frank's thrilling novel, Slush in the Streets. That's right. The film is uh, due for release sometime next month, isn't it? Yes. Now, I wonder if uh, you'd care to tell us a little bit about the plot and about the uh, role you play. Well, uh, no, I don't think there's anything I want to say about it, particularly. <clears throat> Some of the critics are already saying that it may win you uh, an Academy Award. I doubt it. And uh, I have a uh, notation here about uh, that great new record album of yours. Well, what about it? <laughs> well, I know it's uh, made up of uh, your readings of the speeches of Grover Cleveland. Uh, what's the title? You know, I don't remember. It's... Uh... Pretty much of a dog, uh, I know that. Well, you're going to be doing more of those dramatic readings here in the uh, sunset room of the El Grotto, right? Uh, it's in that room down at the end of the hall. I don't know what they call it. Is that what it is, the sunset room? Yeah. yeah. And well, that's where it'll be. While we have you here at uh, our Bob and Ray microphones, I certainly want to ask you about your lovely wife, Brenda Robespierre. Did she make the trip to Las Vegas, Mel? No. I guess film commitments uh, kept her in Hollywood, huh? Uh... I don't know where she is. I don't care either, you know. Well, it's been wonderful uh, chatting with you again, Mel. And I uh, want to wish you every success in your engagement here at the Sunset Room of the El Grotto Hotel. This is John Ralph Phipps Line returning you to step, Bob right? and Ray in New York. Now, Tanglefoot, the greatest name in flypaper, brings you another episode of One Feller's Family. As we look in on the household now, we find Father. Yes, Sadly. What? Did you remember to call up the oil burner people? What for? Have them come and check the furnace. Well, why don't you do things like that? Why do I have to remember? Fanny, 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 I distinctly told you this morning to give them a telephone call. Well, you were sitting right by the yes. phone when you told me that. That may well be. It isn't as though you had to go out any place. You're right here all the day yourself. Yes. I don't know why you couldn't check 
the furnace Always yourself. Always a good idea to have the furnace checked before the first cold weather. Well, I know. I'm... It's always babe. too late to check the furnace after it's too cold. What? I say it's too late to check the furnace after you need it. You're talking juicy again. Yes, <laughs> I've been meaning to see Dennis Tucker for some weeks now. Well, why don't you go down and see him right after you call the people to check the furnace? Yes, well, we'll have to have it checked today or tomorrow. Weatherman says a cold snap is on the way. Hmm. Well, I do think, though, that you yes. should check it. It yes. hasn't been checked in over a year. Well, I can't check it myself, Annie. I know that. Know I didn't... about s- furnaces. I didn't say for you to check it. I said for you to fairly, call them. Fairly, fairly, fairly. And go get the dentist to take a look at you. You're yes. talking much too juicy. Yes. What's more important, my oral dental facade or the furnace? Checking the furnace, I suppose. You've been listening to One Feller's Family, brought to you by Panucci, the greatest name in fudge. Today's episode, entitled Checking the Furnace, was taken from Book 33, Chapter XII, pages 14, 15, 16, and the bottom of page 2. One Fellow's Family is written and produced by T. Wilson Messy. This is a Messy production. Once again, we've had our Bob and Ray scouts combing the railroad and bus stations here in New York, searching for people with human interest stories to tell. We have three of them here at the studio now, and I think we'll talk to this lady first. You're Mrs. Ephraim Dibble from McKeesport, Pennsylvania. Is that right? That's right, and I can never thank you enough for enabling me to come up here and tell my story. Well, we're here to help folks in trouble, Miss Dibble. Now, would you tell us just what your problem is? Well, it's about my husband. He's the sole support of the family. You have nine kids, I believe. Yes, we have nine kiddies. And last Tuesday week, I believe it was... Ephraim was putting up storm windows when he fell off the ladder. Well, was he badly hurt, Miss Dibble? Well, we don't know. We haven't been able to scrape up the money to have a doctor come over and look at him yet. So he's just resting in bed until you can get the money for the doctor, is that right? No, he's still lying there at the bottom of the ladder. He's a big, heavy man, and I just can't move him at all. I see. Mm-hmm. I've hooked up the TV set so he can watch it through the dining room window, but that's about all I can do. Well, we've certainly been touched by your story, Miss Dibble, and... We want you to have this lovely seven-horsepower bandsaw made by Arm Brewster of Cleveland. If it's an Arm Brewster, it's the finest. Well, this is going to do me a fat lot of good. And now, this gentleman here, you're Mr. Reginald C. Hollinger of Lima or Lima, Ohio. Is that correct? Well, it's Lima. That's yes. correct. Reginald C. Hollinger. And according to the report from our scouts, you really have a fascinating story, Mr. Hollinger. As I understand, you had some trouble with the law in your younger days. Now you're trying to set up a recreation room for teenage boys so that they'll have a better chance in life than you had. Well, that's right. And uh, all I need now is a room with maybe a snooker table and a slot machine or two. The kids in my neighborhood have no place they can go. They need a place where they can plan their rumbles and split up the loot after a job. Well, Mr. Hollinger, yours is a wonderful story of community spirit. And here for you is this beautiful automatic orange juicer. Well, these young punks aren't going to be satisfied to stand around all day squeezing oranges. <clears throat> I can tell you that right now. Finally, we have this lady here. She's Mrs. Eppa Yumble from Westport, Connecticut. And our scouts found her crying her eyes out at Grand Central Station. Something about medical care for your son, wasn't it, Mrs. Yumble? <laughs> yes. My little boy has one white eyebrow... And I finally saved enough money to bring him to one of the big clinics here in New York. All right, now just take it easy, Miss Yumble. We're here to help you. And what happened at the clinic? Well, when they found out that my husband is president of one of the biggest steel companies in New England, they said we weren't eligible for free medical treatment. So you and the little boy are on your way back to Westport now. Yes, I just don't know where to turn now. You're a brave woman, Mrs. Yumble. We want you to have this lovely matched pair of automobile fog lights. They're made by the Struage Company, tops for craftsmanship. Well, if you can show me how you can cure a white eyebrow with fog lights, I'd certainly like to see you do it. So once more, the Bob and Ray organization has extended a helping hand to those in need. Mm-hmm.